Hi, everybody. Welcome to our live at five. Today's topic is addiction. And I'm going to be live with Dr. Hashal Karani, who is one of the head doctors at Wellbridge Addiction, Addiction Center, a brand new addiction center in Long Island. Hi, Ray. So I'm going to bring in Dr. Karani. Here we go. Hi, Dr. Karani. Hi there. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I can't see you yet. So it's still connecting. Are you able to see me? I can see you. Nice trees in the background there. Oh, <laughs> do you have uh, your video on? Uh, I am getting some assistance from our IT specialist here. Give me one moment. Okay. So a couple things we're gonna talk about today. The main subject matter is addiction with Dr. Hershal. Karani, who is and research center in Calverton, Long Island. <clears throat> so thank you everyone for joining us. We will be, I'm doing great. So thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Chris is not here. <laughs> You missed his yoga uh, cameo earlier. He was not in his birthday suit. For those of you who ask, who are asking. <laughs> um, hi, hello everybody. So Dr. Karani, we lost Dr. Karani, but he will be coming back in shortly. <laughs> Ah, hi, Ray. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're going to bring him back in. Get going on this more serious topic of addiction with Dr. Karani. There you are. Hello. Hi there. Apologies. Not at all. As Dr. the saying Karani. goes, all, all things worth having are as difficult as they are rare. Are worth waiting for, right? Exactly. <laughs> So a couple things about addiction in our talk today. Um, you know, there's this false assumption that it is about willpower and choice when addiction is a form of um, mental illness and it's time to stop distinguishing between physical illness and mental illness and treat it as illness because that is, you know, essentially one and the same. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about with you again today, uh, I know we had such a wonderful um, chat about this on the phone yesterday, and this speaks to the new treatment center that you run, Wellbridge. Uh, so to beat addiction is the easy part. Uh, finding why people self-medicate is really the true challenge. And what I was so interested in what you said yesterday is how Wellbridge being this medically based, science-based treatment center treats the whole body uh, and all of the underlying issues that might um, cause someone to self-medicate. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the statistics uh, with you and you know, in 2018, I guess they did a, a substance abuse and the substance abuse and mental health services came out with a reported 21 million Americans uh, were in need of treatment for substance disorder. Um, and I wanted you to talk about these statistics and how they seem to be escalating during this very sensitive time this very um, anxious uh, time we're living in. 
So I'll leave it to you. Thank you. It is a tremendous privilege to be able to connect with your audience and so many of the themes that you're raising um, have a, a really complex foundation. And I, I look forward to kind of uh, disentangling each of those um, as, as we have a chance to speak today. Uh, the first piece to start with is just the burden of illness that's present in our country uh, that's captured by this number of uh, 20 plus million Americans. Uh, and that only really focuses on adults over 18 uh, that likely struggle with substance use disorder, which is the, the medical term for what we commonly refer to as addiction. And I want to start just by clarifying that um, distinction between addiction and substance use disorder. By framing uh, the pattern of behavior that we associate with addiction as a disorder, uh, it immediately highlights the significance of the brain, the body, and the mind as the central substrates of where these processes take root. Our position at Wellbridge, and, and certainly a, a contemporary position of modern addiction care, is that addiction is a chronic, treatable brain disease. The path by which treatment unfolds certainly can vary, um, as is the case with many illnesses that we manage in modern medicine. Uh, and the experience of one individual uh, generally occupies one spot on a broad spectrum of experiences. Uh, and I think having that appreciation that each individual brings to the table uh, likely a very different set of individual experiences, family circumstances, social circumstances, cultural circumstances, uh, has to inform the way in which we're seeing their experience of addiction. Which kind of brings me to the, the first point of, of self-medication. Uh, that's certainly a, uh, a common pattern and a, and a dominant hypothesis, if you will, as to what drives individuals uh, to start to use substances, uh, but it doesn't necessarily encapsulate uh, all experiences. Uh, and, uh, and being able to uh, have the opportunity to actually open a dialogue with someone struggling with SUD and gain a deeper understanding of what their experience is of the world uh, is such a central part to be able to then understand how to treat the, the, the illness they're suffering with. Um, Great. So, so you operate, run a brand new addiction center, and it's, it's quite a, a, an amazing one at that with a huge campus, uh, only 70 miles from New York City, which is great uh, for those of us in New York State. And there are 14, over 14,000 addiction treatment centers in the U.S., and Wellbridge is one of the mi minority science-based ones, physician-based addiction centers, um, which I didn't really understand until you outlined it for me, how important that is. Uh, why is this approach, can you outline it for our viewers? Why is this approach important? Um, why is it important to uphold a medical model that goes beyond standards of care that have been widely accepted in, in um, treatment centers? Our sincere hope is that by bringing forth a science-driven approach, it allows us to systematically evaluate the process of SUD as a disease, to learn from the experiences of patients that are coming to treatment here at Wellbridge, and to be able to identify and evolve the way addiction itself is treated. That's really at the heart of a medical model, that you're applying a scientific method where you're learning from the interventions you're making and continually advancing the care that you're delivering. And, you know, in, in many ways, uh, this is not that novel a concept in most of medicine. Uh, when we look at 
oncology, when we look at endocrinology, uh, we see many institutions, um, whether you know, from, from academic settings uh, to settings in the community, where you have an intermingling of contemporary scientific tools that are actually being translated to the bedside so people have access to them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for a number of reasons, which I would very much like to highlight, uh, addiction has remained in the shadows from the contemporary framework of how we manage illness. And uh, perhaps the most salient barrier to that has been the still very pervasive perception that addiction is a moral failing, that addiction ultimately is something that gets stigmatized. And so the resources, the attention uh, that it really deserves as uh, now, especially one of the most significant health burdens in our country, um, continues to be very slow to, to percolate. Uh, I um, am, am very humble to have the, the responsibility of being part of uh, an organization that's coming to Long Island and certainly hopes to serve uh, all of New York State and, and hopefully the country in time. Uh, but with that, uh, it's taken a uh, tremendous vision. Uh, our founder, his name is Andrew Drazen, and uh, partners uh, Engel Berman, which is a real estate development group in Long Island, really brought a, a very visionary kind of entrepreneurial spirit to bring forth a version of addiction care that has just been incredibly difficult to achieve anywhere else. I, I um, wish Andrew were, were here today to share um, his story, uh, but, uh, but I'll paraphrase for a moment. And um, I, I think it really captures something that uh, is certainly at the heart of many of those that have struggled with addiction, that offer recovery services. Andrew grew up in Long Island and at a very young age, uh, his mother passed away uh, from uh, a very complex course of, of struggles with substance use issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the indelible impression that he was left with it at that early stage in his life was that this was just something that can't be talked about whatever the circumstances were around his mother's death uh, was just brushed under the rug. And it wasn't until there's a huge, there's a huge stigma. against Right. And um, it wasn't the until shame, the victimization, the, the gender bias, all of it. 100%. Um, and in fact, those are the experiences that patients will most often convey they experience when they access or try to access care in general medical settings. Uh, and so individuals that are struggling with addiction are trying to get care and they're treated in, in a way that doesn't respect their dignity, which generally doesn't invite someone to continue doing that process. Uh, and on the flip side, uh, the practitioners themselves, the majority of physicians today um, are also not prepared to treat addiction. Mm -hmm. So it's a really problematic kind of one-two punch where patients have resistance to seek care and then those that are trying to or are there to deliver care are not really prepared to offer proper services. And that story actually uh, certainly goes back many decades in the U.S., uh, perhaps a few centuries, all the way uh, to the temperance movement. Uh, in fact, um, for, for the local uh, Southampton crowd, uh, I, I happened upon, uh, there's a church in uh, kind of the, the village of Southampton. Uh, I think it dates back to the late 1600s or so. Uh, and outside, there are gallows. And if you read the inscription on the gallow, it says, 
for the drunkard. Hmm. And, uh, you know, there aren't many other disease processes uh, that have been treated in um, such a punitive way that the, the way to manage this was to uh, shackle somebody and uh, put them on display in the middle of a town. Uh, and so there's still residue of that perception that, that still remains. Uh, we have, please. Well, I was going to say that uh, part of Wellbridge uh, is they are affiliated with Northwell Health, which is New York's largest healthcare system. And that gives you an advantage, obviously. Um, but there's a level of compassion and authenticity that uh, you apply in treating the whole person. Uh, I wanted you to talk about a little bit about how important those things are, like AA, NA services and supports, uh, behavioral therapies, uh, pharmacological therapies, substitution therapies, thing like things like that. All of those are um, incredibly uh, important ingredients. Um, while we are emphasizing a science-based approach, uh, we are uh, very, very supportive of if you will, traditional strategies towards addiction care, such as 12-step frameworks. Um, I uh, will be the first to say, I, I think 12-step has, uh, particularly AA, uh, has helped certainly more Americans find a path to recovery than any other single resource. Uh, one of the biggest challenges broadly in addiction care, and kind of speaking back to the, the number you, you cited of 21 million Americans that are struggling with SUD is that only about one out of 10 ever accesses any care. Hmm. That is such a profound dilemma, particularly for uh, a healthcare professional. If the vast majority of folks that could benefit from the skills, the, the, the resources I could possibly offer them will never access care, uh, it, it keeps me up at night. And so what is it about those nine out of 10 that are not accessing care. Uh, and one of the most important first steps in any process of recovery is engagement and having an array of resources available, whether it's 12 step, smart recovery, uh, a variety of virtual platforms, uh, that is an essential first ingredient to start the conversation. From there though, uh, it's important to be able to have effective tools to help shift the underlying biologic processes that are generally inextricably tied to a substance use disorder, as well as other behavioral interventions to provide an array of coping skills, structure, and that also very quickly also points to just general wellness. I am very much an adherent that the, the goal of modern medicine is not to eliminate disease, it, it's to promote health. And if a addiction treatment setting can provide an environment that can really optimize health, then we're starting to move towards things that are um, a lot more sustainable. Can you talk about what some of the barriers are to finding care? Hi there. <laughs> Sorry, he's going back to the city to do his show. So <laughs> quick goodbye. So he has clothes on. So that <laughs> answers that question. <laughs> yeah. No birthday suit today. Folks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the interruption. So, so what are some of those barriers? Could you just touch upon them to finding uh, the care that's needed for the, you know, why, why is that statistic one in 10 it's so challenging? So on the level of the individual, the themes we named of shame, stigmatization, certainly functions as a deterrent to, to go in to start uh, any process of care. One of the especially challenging aspects of 
addiction processes themselves is that they are marked by a tremendous sense of denial. Generally, when someone's ill or struggling or in pain, uh, the body kind of actualizes a wish for that to, to be alleviated and to seek support. Addiction, and as we've gained, uh, uh, continue to gain a deeper scientific and, and mm -hmm. behavioral understanding of it, uh, the nuances of that denial uh, are incredibly complex. Finding ways to create a safe, welcoming, and engaging framework to diffuse that denial, to soften the shame, uh, is hard to find. And one of the things that we are especially proud of at Wellbridge is that we've created an environment that really doesn't look like anything else in healthcare. It's an environment that from the moment folks walk through our doors really resonates with that sense of dignity, that here's where the things you've been struggling with can be treated and, and will be treated with respect. Now, the impact of addiction, uh, someone was mentioning uh, the drink, uh, drinking and isolation are some of the things that have um, escalated um, addiction in communities. Um, do you have any statistics or data on that yet? Uh, I have um, some local data certainly to share. Um, back up for a moment to say um, there has been an incredibly challenging opioid crisis that's unfolded throughout the country. Uh, it's impacted communities in, in many different ways. When we look at Long Island in particular, uh, Suffolk County, Nassau County, both have had really uh, inordinately higher rates of overdose deaths uh, over the last 10 years in particular compared to the rest of the state in New York. Uh, and this also uh, kind of circles back to the question of barriers. Yeah. Suffolk County uh, doesn't have a lot of resources for uh, the treatment of SUD broadly, but specifically for OUD or opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been a number of studies that have clearly demonstrated that the rate of overdose deaths generally correlates in direct proportion, uh, or rather inverse proportion, excuse me, to the availability of care and access to medication-assisted treatment, access to inpatient residential services. Uh, and it's perhaps not, not surprising that a disease that's going unchecked will likely progress and have catastrophic consequences. One of the other real fundamental pieces of mitigating overdose deaths is the availability of naloxone rescue kits, or simply uh, Narcan, which is, uh, as far as I'm concerned now, just an extension of basic CPR. It's something that I feel every American should be familiar with. Uh, and we're seeing in communities uh, such as in West Virginia, the state that's really been most exquisitely impacted by the opioid crisis, uh, where they've instituted training programs for kids as young as five to uh -huh. prepare them because they may be the only person that can make an intervention um, in their home. Uh, what, 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 how does the, uh, what role does the New York State, uh, State Government Oasis, the Division of, the, or the Office of Addiction Services and Support have in that? in that future, in that, in, in helping towards that future? Uh, they really occupy a very central role in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, all licensed uh, inpatient, residential, outpatient addiction facilities um, have to be scrutinized by OASIS. Uh, they uh, have obviously a, a, a broad array of uh, services and types of functions that they hold treatment centers accountable to. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many ways, I, I feel they're incredibly progressive in recognizing the importance of evidence-based practices, the rec recognizing the importance of the availability of 
medications uh, to treat addiction, also kind of commonly referred to as medication-assisted treatment, uh, and also the, the broad effort of making uh, naloxone kits available, uh, just to name a few. Um, there's a, a strong synergy with OASIS and the Department of Health, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that gets implemented uh, at county levels um, throughout the state. They have been uh, incredibly supportive of Wellbridge, uh, going back now several years as, as the project uh, kind of emerged as a, an idea in uh, Andrew Drazen's mind uh, to now fast forward to partnering with Northwell Health and, and bringing this entire campus to reality. Uh, Oasis has been a very strong advocate for us. And I think ultimately, I, I'd like to believe that they see uh, us is just a tremendous resource for the state of New York. How has, I think the burning question on everyone's minds really is how has the escalation in racial injustices been a catalyst to susceptibility to developing substance abuse issues right now or in general? Right. That, that um, is, I think, uh, such a, prominent, prominent aspect of the history of addiction in the U.S. and how it's been treated um, both from a medical and judicial perspective. Uh, there are uh, profound uh, racial disparities, um, looking at the way narcotics laws were handled uh, from more recent decades uh, to now where vulnerable and underserved communities that are predominantly made up of uh, minority residents don't have access to care. And uh, you see disproportionate rates of heroin overdose, fentanyl overdose, um, uh, and an inability to access basic tools like naloxone. It, I, I will add though that uh, was especially true during the early phase of the opioid crisis. Uh, when illicit drugs were most widely available in poor disenfranchised communities, in more well-to-do and middle-class communities, the primary driver of the opioid crisis was prescription opioids. And that created a very interesting dissonance because as the volume of opioid prescribing dramatically increased, uh, for the first time in uh, really the, the kind of uh, last century that um, uh, there were, there's evidence of declining life expectancy among middle-class, wealthy, and white Americans. And one of the primary drivers of that has been uh, the consequences of the opioid crisis. Uh, so that that's one, I think, very powerful aspect of how um, the availability and access to care um, is divided among racial lines. Uh, on the flip side, when we look at the way in which uh, judicial practices, uh, uh, particularly when we look, for instance, at cocaine, uh, the minimum sentencing that was focused around crystalline or crack cocaine uh, was disproportionately greater than powder cocaine. Uh, mm. And those substances generally divided uh, by socioeconomic and racial lines. So just to name a few of the themes that uh, I think um, often... Yeah, that I didn't know. And, and um, this... Uh, certainly is a, a, a unique aspect of addiction medicine that brings into, all, uh, into play all of these other social aspects of life um, and the social determinants of health. But when we start to look at racial disparities and broader social injustices, uh, the, the narrative of addiction care in our country, uh, unfortunately, tells a, a lot of really harrowing stories. 
So I want to go to some of the viewer questions now, Dr. Karani, if that's okay. And for those of you who've just joined us, we're talking to Dr. Uh, Harshal Karani, who is one of the heads at Wellbridge Addiction and Treatment and Research Center, uh, which is a brand new treatment center for addiction in Long Island, uh, in Calverton, Long Island. And Alex uh, Marino has a question. Are there tactics family members can use to help with substance abuse during sheltering in place? So we've talked a lot about the opioid crisis. And um, unfortunately, in 2020, uh, just really a, such a uh, unprecedented set of circumstances where a pandemic is now superimposed on a crisis. Um, the ingredients generally that culminate in individuals either having an intensification of their substance issues or for that matter, developing issues for the first time include things like isolation, stress, uncertainty, financial insecurity, uh, which is essentially the checkbox of things that COVID has brought for many, many Americans and many, many families. Uh, so my uh, direct answer would be to identify things that can alleviate those very domains. Uh, so strategies to eliminate isolation uh, would focus around finding ways to meaningfully connect. I think it's been a really great trend to see the spectrum of virtual tools and platforms um, uh, as we're engaging in right now um, to bring people together. There's been a push over the last decade to expand telemedicine platforms, telepsychiatry platforms, uh, but it's been challenging. And I'd like to believe that some of the kind of barriers to that have been diminished in the midst of COVID. And, and I hope that that continues to persist uh, as we get through the pandemic. Uh, and hopefully that creates more pathways for folks to get care. Are there uh, affordable uh, or even free um, uh, telemedicine vehicles that can be accessed? I mean, affordability is a big issue with addiction too. Absolutely. Um, there, um, so actually circling back to Oasis, um, I thought in a, in a very uh, timely way, they started to loosen some of the restrictive aspects of telemedicine to enable practitioners uh, to be able to connect with patients in a more readily available fashion. So for instance, there previously used to be a requirement that you had to meet a patient in person for the first session before you could transition into um, telemedicine. Uh, so now, removing that first step altogether uh, creates easier pathway to, to access care. OASIS has definitely compiled a spectrum of resources uh, geared towards uh, uh, more affordable uh, and free care. Uh, Northwell Health uh, has brought together a broad array of mental health practitioners, counselors, to help provide support to all of the caregivers at the front lines. Uh, and that is at least one instance of a framework that's being offered for free and uh, lends itself to uh, virtual platforms and folks gathering uh, in groups, uh, but doing it online. Uh, the uh, just, just to echo that question about uh, how to deal with it at home right now, um, earlier, someone just asked, Michael, is there a best way to talk to someone about their addictive behavior? That's one of the most uh, common questions I get. And uh, there certainly are more effective ways and less effective ways. But before you can really start to get at the language and content of it, any approach, the most important ingredient is trust. 
there are strategies that can be employed to help build trust and safety first, which really sets the foundation for any conversation. Um, as a uh, healthcare provider, uh, that's usually one of the first priorities that I have to address when I first meet a patient to make them feel safe, to make them feel trusted, uh, to make them feel as though I'm not judging them or what they're going through. Uh, and I think those same principles apply when you're trying to engage a family member. Unfortunately, that can be incredibly hard. It's uh, in, in some ways that that has been the mystique or, or the power of 12 step programs that focus on anonymity, that you can kind of start with that blank slate, which it's in, impossible to do with the ones we love and, and our own family. That's where having support to sometimes serve as a liaison to help build skills for the family members, for the family unit, uh, whether that's in the form of counseling or formal family therapy. Uh, there are a number of tools that can be really powerful. Does Wellbridge provide that support for family members who are trying to help other family members with addiction? Yes. Uh, that is really one of the most central pieces. Uh, we viewed that by building a facility um, in Long Island, it will allow for families to be very, very close uh, to the process of care, as opposed to perhaps not so distant past when the primary options were sending a loved one to Florida, to California, right. and just kind of wishing that whatever happens there works out and then they come back and they're fixed or they're cured. Uh, we fundamentally believe that the family has to be part of the process. The family needs space for their own healing and uh, have actually developed uh, a very research informed framework in collaboration with uh, a primary research scientist that focuses on family therapy, uh, a framework of care that starts actually from the moment, or at least potentially can start from the moment someone first reaches out to us. That if the individual is agreeable and, and willing, that we'll start processes with their family. We can start those processes virtually, we can start them on the phone. And as that process allows the family to engage, the most valuable direct byproduct of that is it allows an opportunity for the patient to further engage in the process. It's not just their problem. It's not just their the laundry list of things to do, but this can be a shared process that hopefully can improve the quality of life for everyone in the family. And in, in, in fact, I'll, I'll share a very interesting fairly recent epidemiologic statistic, yeah. when you evaluate the healthcare utilization of family members of an individual struggling with addiction, as the individual engages care and their SUD issues start to resolve, the amount of healthcare the family consumes decreases. The family gets healthier. Wow, that's good and, news. Right, um, and, and I think um, by being able to integrate all of that in one place here at Wellbridge, um, we're certainly very hopeful that um, families are, are eager and, and willing to, to participate. So Christina had a question. Can you talk about how addicts tend to get over one addiction only to become addicted to something else from a hard drug to alcohol or alcohol to food? That's a, a great question. And um, my response would really be uh, kind of two-tiered to focus. Um, one, a biological kind of explanation and separately a behavioral one. Uh, the biological explanation is that there are uh, a number of incredibly complex areas in the brain that are involved in the development of an addictive behavior, 
the maintenance of that behavior, uh, and then subsequently the, the hopeful termination of that behavior. Depending on where uh, an individual is in that curve, the underlying compulsivity and impulsivity that often really marks an addictive behavior can get transferred to another set of targets, if you will. So somebody struggling with, say, an opioid issue that makes a tremendous amount of effort to uh, overcome that or subdue that uh, can remain vulnerable to developing those same biological patterns towards another target. Hmm. What often um, a, a somewhat healthy transition that um, can often be quite powerful is when individuals struggling with a substance behavior can shift that underlying biologic drive towards wellness pursuits, towards mindfulness practices, towards physical exercise. There is the risk that those activities themselves can start to become pathological and unproductive. Uh, but that's a balancing act that certainly has to be weighed and uh, something that uh, at Wellbridge, uh, we have been very thoughtful in designing an entire wellness and creative arts therapy framework that introduces these concepts in ways that are appropriately calibrated for where an individual is at and hopefully sets up a stage that they can continue to explore on that platform uh, as they move forward. The separate domain that I uh, alluded to was the behavioral. Uh, many times substance use behaviors are deeply tied to social context, to specific triggers, to relationships. Uh, and so as perhaps one substance is being addressed, those behavioral patterns still remain uh, in a loop. And it can, again, create a vulnerability where another substance can come to occupy uh, the, the void that's been created by removing one, one problematic issue uh, and then it getting replaced by another. Uh, and, and so here, you know, I, I certainly feel that uh, having the support and structure of uh, a clinician can be really helpful to help avoid certain uh, pitfalls or hazards. Mm -hmm. And there's many tiers of clinicians that I think are very effective in helping folks navigate substance use issues. Uh, in New York State, uh, Addiction counselors are known as CASACs. Um, that's a certification for providing addiction care. Uh, but nurses, therapists, psychologists, physicians, specialists, uh, uh, there's a whole spectrum of resources um, that can help provide guidance uh, as someone's hopefully starting to, to make changes to improve their quality of life. Dr. Karani, uh, Bobby is asking, what is the best way to help someone that is dealing with addiction but doesn't understand that he or she is an addict that needs treatment? What approach would you take as a healthcare professional? So if I had the privilege of actually having this individual in front of me, uh, it, it would imply that a number of steps have already started to unfold in that individual's life. Uh, at least under most circumstances. There's definitely the scenario where someone just feels really coerced to, to go see somebody and uh, their arms twisted. And unfortunately, those, those scenarios don't always go so well. But if someone has shifted from being in a state uh, of what's described as pre-contemplation, where they're, they're not even conceiving of the fact that they're struggling with a substance issue to the state of actually contemplating, well, maybe this is something that I could benefit from uh, getting support with, getting help. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, I, I, I uh, 
so much of the hard work has already been done. Uh, and I always, always view that first interaction with a patient as such a precious one. Because the steps that they've already gone through to be willing to come to that uh, are usually quite immense. Uh, for, for Bobby, though, the, the question would be uh, to start by just engaging the person they're concerned about uh, in an open dialogue around what substance use represents in their life. Many times what becomes apparent is that when you actually allow someone the space to express what they're really feeling or expressing, excuse me, what they're really feeling, they'll start to express an underlying wish to change. There will be a natural reflex, a natural kind of impulse to change their behavior, usually towards healthier goals. As opposed to the kind of guns blazing approach where you're immediately jumping to saying, you have a problem, you need help, you need X, Y, and Z, uh, which usually has the untoward consequence of just having folks kind of tighten up the, the, the jacket more and not really get into the themes that are playing out in their life. So, why are mental health services so important to treat both issues concurrently? A another statistic uh, I'll share is that uh, among those that struggle with substance use disorder, upwards of 80% have a primary mental health issue. The most common issues among adult Americans today are depression, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, and we usually refer to these as co-occurring disorders. They're co-occurring with the primary substance issue. It quickly though can give rise to the chicken and egg dilemma of which comes first, which is more important. Uh, and I think effective treatment moves away from trying to assign a priority to one or the other, but by really trying to address both in parallel. Because uh, very often, if one domain is left untreated, it will create a vulnerability for the other. If someone's underlying traumatic experiences or ongoing symptoms from a traumatic experience are not meaningfully being addressed, those can be the most potent triggers to use a substance. And vice versa, if someone continues using a substance, uh, it could potentially be putting them in high-risk situations or dangerous situations um, and potentially uh, making them susceptible to additional trauma. Uh, so the interplay between mental health and substance use disorders is just so, so critical, uh, and being able to treat both uh, from the outset of when someone's accessing care uh, is really, really a, a vital contemporary development. Thank you. Uh, Michael was asking, and I think you, you just answered this, is there any relationship between trauma and addiction? I guess you talked about PTSD, which is trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is one of the concurring, co-occurring disorders that you mentioned. Right. Um, so uh, it, one important distinction to make is between traumatic experiences and PTSD itself. Uh, PTSD uh, is, again, a medical framework for a disorder uh, in which an individual has long-standing residual effects from a prior traumatic event. Many individuals that experience trauma do not have PTSD. 
many individuals that experience the same trauma uh, have different outcomes. Some don't go on to develop symptoms or the constellation of features that we define as PTSD, um, and others uh, develop very profound symptoms. PTSD fundamentally uh, has really four hallmark features. Uh, those include nightmares, flashbacks or kind of reliving experiences during the day, avoidance, where uh, potential triggers or circumstances that simulate aspects of the traumatic event uh, create a lot of fear and uh, start to really dramatically reshape a person's life. Uh, and, the, and the final is hypervigilance, where an individual is always on alert, is always on guard, uh, a potential threat. Uh, so looking at those qualities themselves, it's perhaps not surprising that substances that can serve as a buffer to kind of soften, to diminish the intensity of those kinds of symptoms uh, can start to become more and more prominent fixtures of someone's life. Alcohol, opiates, or perhaps prime examples uh, that help to tune down that persistent noise that someone may be experiencing, um, and in some ways, at least initially, make it seem as though life is more manageable. Uh, so, very often there are themes of trauma in someone's life that struggling with substance use disorder, uh, but I, um, I, I certainly don't uh, subscribe to or, or want to suggest that everyone struggling with a substance use disorder um, has had some trauma and um, that the goal of treatment is to try to kind of dig to find this specific event in someone's life. Um, ultimately, for a care provider, uh, the patient really has to be the guide. The individual has to be the guide identify what are the events in their life uh, that are of meaning that may have contributed to a substance behavior. Uh, often traumatic events have a major uh, contributing factor though. Thank you. You know, you talked earlier about this loop of behavioral patterns uh, and how you have to recognize them and change those uh, habits, create new wellness habits, um, and avoid the triggers. Uh, how do you teach that, educate on that, and implement that at WellBridge? What are sort of the tools that you use for that? One of the uh, real commitments that we've made in developing WellBridge is to identify high quality credentialed practitioners. Uh, I uh, am an addiction psychiatrist. Uh, I uh, went to medical school. I did a residency in psychiatry. Uh, I did a fellowship in brain imaging and subsequently in addiction care. I've spent a good portion of my life trying to understand addiction and trying to develop skills uh, to be able to support others. We have assembled uh, an array of team members, a very interdisciplinary team of folks that bring the same kind of expertise to the table. In the domain of wellness, uh, we have a licensed creative arts therapist that oversees our Center for Creative Arts. And within that framework, uh, there's four core modalities that are being administered. There's dance movement therapy, music therapy, drama therapy, uh, and art therapy. And so when an individual is presented with so many options, by having expert guidance to calibrate the type of interventions that will make sense for them, that again, echo a place of safety and trust and allow an individual to gain that new language, um, something really powerful unfolds. We took the same approach 
to our wellness center. We collaborated with an exercise physiologist to develop a exercise manual. We um, have structured it in a phasic way so that whether it's someone that's a, a has not been uh, engaged in all that much activity at all, or it's a, a, an elite athlete, that we can calibrate interventions uh, that, again, are accessible, that are comfortable, uh, and usually those are the types of things that stick. Uh, and I think that uh, when we look at wellness broadly, uh, the, the, the real value of any new behavior uh, is the ability for us to sustain it in our life. Uh, and I certainly am of the belief that uh, generally when we're first introduced to things, um, if we can quickly gain a sense of confidence uh, or competency with it, we're much more likely to keep doing it. So, Trisha is asking, with all the new and different types of therapies you mentioned, what is a typical day like at Wellbridge? And also, how long is the treatment session? Is it the 30 days? Is it longer? So um, I'll, I'll start with the second part. Um, we have three different levels of care at Wellbridge. Uh, and often in the context of addiction treatment, you'll hear the term levels of care. Uh, the kind of national organizations that uh, help shape a lot of addiction care policy uh, have, have st structured care in this way. And, and when we look at the state level, OASIS actually provides licensures based on levels of care. So we have uh, inpatient stabilization and withdrawal management unit. Uh, that generally uh, de delivers care on the order of days. Uh, and that's really the very initial phase uh, for someone who's medically unstable uh, that needs a lot of medical oversight. We, we have 24-7 nursing oversight. We have um, uh, nearly all day uh, physician coverage, um, but physicians are here every day. We also have NPs, PAs that kind of round out the, the full complement of providers. Uh, and that's separate from the clinical interventions, which uh, are led by therapists and counselors. From that level of care, you transition to inpatient rehabilitation, uh, which generally takes place over the course of weeks. Uh, and then finally is residential treatment, uh, which can take place over the course of months. One of the real challenges that has come to dominate addiction care in our country is that there is very often a calendar care that unfolds, whether that's dictated by managed care, whether that's dictated by the circumstances in someone's life. Unfortunately, um, instead of looking at whether or not someone has actually achieved an effective and stable stage of recovery, the care itself is truncated based solely on the duration of time someone was there. So you're here for five days, that's it, you're done, moving on. And uh, we certainly have tried to move away from that. Uh, but with that, we also want to make sure that Wellbridge is accessible to uh, as many New Yorkers as possible. Uh, so we have been very, active in pursuing managed care contracts. Uh, we're now in network with Cigna, uh, which represents almost uh, half a million folks in the tri-state area, which, which we're very excited to be able to provide a resource to. Uh, but there are uh, these balancing acts as uh, to how you really define uh, the duration of effective treatment. And like Pam pointed out, the longer people stay, the better their chances for sustained recovery are. Absolutely. Yes, uh, that's true. Here's a very tough question, but a good one. Can uh, from Farah? Uh, can you apply addiction therapy to self harm behaviors too, like cutting? Uh, 
In uh, many ways, yes. Uh, the underlying mechanisms that often perpetuate self-harm or uh, parasuicidal behaviors uh, follow similar themes to impulsivity and compulsivity. Um, so from a behavioral standpoint, uh, the themes that I, I hope I, I've really echoed uh, throughout uh, of creating a safe space, creating uh, an environment that echoes trust uh, is often the first ingredients that have to be achieved uh, before someone can meaningfully start to shift self-harm behaviors. From a biologic perspective, uh, there is certainly a place where medications um, can be helpful, uh, depending on the individual, depending on the, the circumstances. Uh, I wouldn't view either of those as standalone approaches. I think uh, these are all complements uh, within uh, a framework that uh, hopefully could be a, em, employed by a, a person and uh, the, the clinician that's working with them. One of the specific modalities that often gets a lot of attention in the context of um, suicidal behaviors, parasuicidal behaviors, um, is a framework called DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. Uh, I've heard of that. For the most part, that's uh, delivered in group formats. Uh, but um, to Farah, if um, that's something someone in her life is struggling with, um, that would be the, the, the quick uh, framework of resources I would suggest exploring. Uh, or for that matter, a clinician uh, for individual support or individual therapy um, who has DBT training, uh, that, that can be a, a useful fit. Well, thank you so much. I have, uh, I'll do one more question and then uh, we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone for uh, participating in this very important conversation about addiction. Um, what is your referral process and is Wellbridge affiliated with any local hospitals where we, we talked about that earlier. Um, Wellbridge is affiliated with Northwell Health, which is the largest um, health uh, um, healthcare system in New York State. Um, so, what is your referral process there, Dr. Karani? Uh, so, we have a, a very dedicated admissions team uh, of clinicians um, who are always available to answer the phone. Uh, the easiest way is directly to reach us. Uh, start at simply wellbridge.org. Um, there's all the contact numbers. Uh, our 1 800 number is 1 877 Wellbridge. Uh, broadly, with the health system, uh, Northwell Health has really made a tremendous commitment to expand the continuum of addiction care uh, for the roughly 10 million uh, New Yorkers in their catchment area. Uh, and Wellbridge really represents just one major piece of that. So individuals that are accessing care anywhere um, in the state, but certainly at Northwell facilities, Northwell hospitals, um, can reach out to Wellbridge. Uh, and uh, we will uh, be able to, in a, in a very streamlined manner, uh, connect them with uh, all the services that um, they may be interested in at Wellbridge. So uh, I, I would say the, the website's probably the first, first place to start. Um, this one is for um, Ada, Ada Costa. She said she's having a difficult day. She lost her son seven months ago due to an overdose. He tried different treatments, but lost the battle. Ada, we send our heart out to you. And uh, Dr. Karani, what, kinds of things does Wellbridge as a new treatment center offer for families who are going through uh, the pain of um, loss over addiction? Well, Ada, I uh, certainly appreciate your courage in, in sharing your loss and uh, connecting with this platform. Uh, our uh, family services uh, 
are currently geared towards patients that are in care with us. Um, we are in the process of expanding the capacity to be able to uh, handle the experiences of families uh, independently. Um, that, I, I must say, does circle back to kind of OASIS and having the right licensure to provide such services, which I think is a great thing that there's oversight uh, of any such um, facility. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, I think that there's a number of resources, uh, unfortunately, a number of resources for family members that are dealing with the tragedies that have unfolded in their life due to addiction. Uh, the resource that's perhaps the most uh, robust that I would first turn folks to is um, SAMHSA.gov, G-O-V. Uh, separately uh, would be NAMI, N-A-M-I, dot org. Uh, there uh, are a broad array of uh, support groups, uh, families that uh, continue to process uh, the grief that uh, has uh, unfolded after uh, the, the consequences of, of someone's struggles with SUD. Uh, the final resource um, that I think also comes to mind uh, are 12 step settings where um, you have uh, parallel groups such as Al Anon or um, uh, support groups that are geared for specifically the family members of those struggling with SUD. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karani. We're here today. Uh, Dr. Karani, Dr. Uh, Hashal Karani from Wellbridge Addiction and Treatment and Research Center in Calverton, New York, has shared uh, his incredible um, knowledge with us. He's a, an addiction uh, psychiatrist. And we appreciate so much your time today. Um, uh, there are more questions coming in, but you can go to wellbridge.org or call 1-877-WELLBRIDGE to get more information. Um, is there a way that our viewers can outreach to you directly? Uh, I'm not sure if that's possible or perhaps a telemedicine. Um, so I think the uh, most form for that will be through through the through our website, um, there is a uh, email it. contact. There. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, I'm a tremendous privilege to be able to connect with your audience. Uh, I think, in particular, in the midst of the pandemic, uh, I, if this conversation at least provided some hope and, and direction for someone listening. Uh, that would be incredibly, incredibly meaningful to me. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for navigating us through uh, this illness. And uh, last question, someone was asking if they're, if you're doing COVID testing at um, the center. Yes, you know, one, one of the real advantages of having Northwell Health as a partner is that we've been able to leverage um, all of the expertise and experience uh, as uh, particularly Mr. Dowling was leading the charge throughout the state in, in Long Island. Um, so we uh, have uh, an entire framework of resources to uh, provide testing. Uh, we can even provide testing, uh, at least the, obtain the test at a potential patient's home um, and process it. And then uh, given the just the size and configuration of our campus, uh, in the event that someone is uh, in fact positive for COVID, uh, we have all of the contingencies in place to be able to isolate them so they remain safe, our staff and other patients remain safe, uh, but that they can also have a productive time uh, while they're in treatment. Dr. Karani, thank you so much. We appreciate your time today. Uh, for further questions, you can go to wellbridge.org uh, or call the center and uh, we can't thank you enough um, for all of your wisdom. And uh, this video will remain on my Instagram. So if anyone wants to refer back to it for this uh, uh, relevant and informative 
information, they can do so at any time. Dr. Karani, thank you so much. Thank you. Wishing you the best. Same to you. Thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us today.